Hello there folks, welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show. My name's Tony and I'm here to be your host today and I have John Haller returning to the show today and I hope you enjoy this show. Uh, I think there's a pretty interesting discussion ensues between myself and John during the course of this interview. I'm wanting to offer a very warm welcome to John Haller on the A Minute to Midnight show. We've had John on the show a few times. Like John, you're a, pretty much a recurring guest now because everyone really enjoys when we do have you on. And so I think it's a privilege to have you back on the show today. So welcome, John. Thanks, Tony. It's good to be back. Hey, can I share one thing, though, with you that's sort of... Uh, we didn't talk about this in prep. But it's something that's kind of in the front of my mind. About five years ago, we, for lack of a better term, had a falling out with our longtime church. We, um, I was not happy with the way things were going. I didn't like the direction that things were going. And uh, uh, we'd had a new pastor for a while. And to make a long story short, they held a meeting of the elders. It was a large church here in Columbus. And essentially, we're going to vote me off the elder board. Uh, the claim was that I was divisive, even though they also said that I taught truth better than anybody or more committed to truth than anybody else on the elder board. So we, I resigned and we left and we started a church. And we initially decided to start a Bible study. And we started this Bible study. So this would have been April of 2013. Um, we... Then we needed a place to to meet, so we decided we should have a prayer meeting. So on Tuesday night, we had a prayer meeting because we we didn't have a place to meet, and we didn't even know how many people would show up. But our, we we're going to do a Bible study on Sunday evenings, and uh, the next day I got a call about ten thirty in the morning and said, "Hey, you need to go over to this place because they have a place for you to rent." And we went, and it was a sort of a tiered classroom in the uh, what used to be the CompuServe. Uh, headquarters that had been bought by a church. And I mean, they were charging us a ridiculous amount of a, a ridiculous amount for rent. It was just very cheap. It was like $50 a week uh, for a couple, three hours. It had projectors, sound system, uh, controls that the speaker put. It was, it was, I mean, it was a really answer to prayer. About two months went by and we um, got a letter from the city where this building was located and they were in a dispute with the church that owned the building. They wanted it to be an office building because then they would get the income tax from the people that the local income tax from the people that work there. But the church wanted to turn it into a school, which would be tax exempt. But we got a cease and desist order from the city. And it said, if you don't leave, we'll fine you uh, at least $500 per day until you do, even though we we're only using the church, the building once each week. So that was on a Tuesday. So we had a prayer meeting Tuesday night and Wednesday we had the Lord answered our prayer. We prayed, prayed for a place and we had a better place to meet. And we've been there now for a little bit over five years, but because it's a public agency uh, in a County and they have some, they have a public, some public rooms that they rent but they've decided to sort of focus more on their mission with developmentally disabled people. And so they told us just about a month ago that, you know, they would not rent to us past the end of the year. So we started praying and amazingly uh, about two weeks ago, somebody had driven by an old church. Uh, it actually was used, it was built by the Jehovah's witnesses and it was near where some people lived and there was no for sale sign. Then somebody drove by it the next day and it was for sale. So uh, we uh, met, uh, went over and saw the building last Monday, uh, made an offer contingent on our congregation approving it. And we had a unanimous vote to approve the purchase of the building yesterday. And so the Lord has really done just an amazing thing in providing us this building. But one of the things that we were insistent on when we started the church was that we would never go into debt for a building. Well, as we looked at buildings around town, 
to get a building of any size or configuration was going to cost us anywhere from 1.1 to 1.5 million dollars. Uh, this building is a few miles out into the country, but it's it's near where a lot of our people uh, live that come to church. And we were able to buy a building, seats about 160 in the sanctuary, has some overflow rooms, some other rooms. It's a little bit, not quite as big as we would like. Uh, it's on five and a half acres. And we had saved up about $325,000 for a building. And we were able to purchase this building for $319,000. Wow. Five acres. So it was a... I mean, we couldn't believe the price. It's appraised on the local county's auditor's books at about in the high 400,000s. So um, we made an offer yesterday and it was uh, the congregation voted. We called the people and within 30 minutes they had accepted it. So uh, it's just one of those things, Tony, where God provides that he gives you um, everything you want. I mean, I, what are the odds that this building that fits our needs, that has a lot of property for expansion, would be available for just about the exact amount of money that we had saved up? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, I think some people are going to go, well, but the Jehovah's Witnesses built it. Aren't you a bit worried about the spiritual connection then? Uh, not really. I mean, we're not associated with them. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I take um, churches meet in all sorts of venues. Um, so there's a lot of churches in, in the United States, at least, that meet in movie theaters. Uh, because a lot of times they, they have rooms, they have comfortable seating, uh, pretty good lighting, and uh, they're, not, they're not used on Sunday mornings. So a lot of churches, I mean, it's hard to find a movie theater uh, that's available to rent anywhere around because of this. So I, there's been some people that have expressed some concerns about that. I'm sure that to some people that know the the building and the location that it's prior start uh, use as a, a building by, you know, the Watchtower Society might be an issue. But then on the other hand, maybe some people might accidentally wander in there thinking that they're coming to um, – <laughs> a kingdom hall and they end up, uh, they'll hear the gospel uh -huh. and the truth. So and put um, some good I'm, prayer into it, I suppose, into yeah. cleansing it. And we, yeah. we will be praying for, you know, uh, God's protection and everything on the building. So, uh, we, we considered that and, uh, it's just, it, but it was, to me, it was an amazing story of how God can provide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the need, your needs, even, and this has been ever since we started this little church, it's been this time after time after time. Um, every time we have a need, God provides, and it's usually exactly what we need, or it's better than what we need, and it's always within, you know, the constraints of our budget and keeping and sort of honoring our desire not to uh, borrow any money. So, yeah, that's that's uh, good. So, so anyway, mm. I kind of diverged off of the uh, plan there, but I just thought I would share that because in our, in our view, it's a miracle. Yeah, that sounds very good. Um, and, well, I'm going to put you on the spot slightly now since we were on that subject. What, what, what do you think of churches that re would rent out or hire out um, Masonic lodges and Masonic-owned halls for having their services? Do you think that's acceptable or would you go I, no way? I, th I think that's probably not acceptable. Um, it, if that's the current use of the building, uh, the primary use of the building, I would not use it. Now, if, uh, for example, one of the buildings we were looking at, uh, a congregation wanted to move and expand, and I believe it was a, I believe it was a, it was a lodge of some kind, but I'm not sure if it was Knights of Columbus or, um, I don't know if it was a Masonic Lodge or not. I, To be honest with you, I don't know. Uh, but they've been using it for a number of years. And so I think when you move away from the um, – the, the, when the, the current major use of the building is something like that, then I have some issues with that. I guess where I would be more concerned, Tony, right now is – 
not so much that we we bought a building that had been used as that and then now is going to be dedicated solely to the ward. Yeah. But I'm I think your article or video or something that I saw you put up last week with the um, bringing in to the church of occult symbols and Masonic symbols and pyramids and all of these things is, uh, I think it's more troubling than, um, you know, owning a building that used to be used by yeah. somebody that you not associate well, with. But. Well, it's interesting that you say that because the reason I asked you that is because um, I've sort of since found out that I believe the person that sort of designed a lot of that symbolism that to be in that Arise conference was Russell Evans from Planet Shakers. And apparently Planet Shakers for the first 10 years actually held their services in a Masonic Lodge in Melbourne where they rented per, uh, weekly for their Sunday services. And then I'm kind of going, well, I'm wondering, is there more of a connection than just hi hiring out the building? And I don't know. I pr probably will look into it a bit more. But also I well, noticed on one of the pictures that I posted in that video, uh, um, well, I didn't notice that some people have gone, hey, have you seen this? And it was like, uh, there's a definite 33 on the sleeve of one of the persons standing in the picture and you can't see who that person actually is. All you can see is their arm, really, but there's a 33 on there. And so it's just like, is this coincidence or is this planning, is the person wearing the 33 knowing what they're doing or did someone who designed the media and took the photography knew exactly what was happening? It's just... Either it's bizarre coincidences or it's planned. So anyway, that's that's the reason why I, I, I happened to ask you that because it, it definitely concerns me. And uh, and I was once a part of that church, the Arise Church, that held that conference, you know, with however many thousand people there. And I was completely shocked at that symbolism when I saw it on their Facebook page. Uh, it's well, you just, see, wow. sometimes I think it's it may be that they were in that environment for so long that they sort of lost the ability to discern. So, so sometimes I wonder, I, I see this happening in many, many churches. There's a, a great apologist that I've gotten to know a little bit and spend some time with a guy named Ed Decker. And Ed has written a number of books about uh, Mormonism. He was he was in the Mormon uh church. I hate to use the term church, but he would, he was a Mormon and he's written a lot of things. And we were out in, uh, uh, he lives out in the Palm Springs area and we were on our way to dinner one night and we drove past this huge church, you know, one of these mega churches. And he goes, you know, I went there, uh, last Sunday. He said, you know, and the preacher actually, you know, it was kind of surprising. The preacher was actually doing a pretty good job and he was really bringing it, and then the smoke machine malfunctioned, and it kind of ruined everything. <laughs> and he was he was being a little bit facetious, but sometimes I wonder, you know, if the Masonic influence is more subtle now than it used to be. It there used it's it's just not as active as as it used to be. And so I think what's happened is some of that symbology has sort of gravitated into the evangelical church in America. And I don't know that it's, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, knowing some of the people involved in some of these churches, that they sort of tolerate it out of ignorance as opposed to, you know, trying to bring that symbol symbolism in. There are other churches, though, I don't know if you've studied Bethel Church up in Reading, but, uh, you know, they actually have a, one of their buildings. Yep. I think it's their, they have a pyramid. Yep. The prayer uh, room. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's just like it, it. And so some of them are much more, they're very open with the symbology that they have. And sometimes I'm, I'm pretty sure that they understand in that case, I think they probably do. And, and you look at, uh, some of the album covers from Jesus culture and that type of thing. And the, the use of the pyramids and everything to me is sort of a, a dead giveaway, but you yeah. know, the way the lights are constructed in a lot of these mega churches create these multiple pyramids. Yes. And I'm, I'm concerned about it. It's deliberate. And, and that, that Bethel, um, 
church again somebody pointed out to me another video i'd done with the symbolism with the pyramids and the as above so below one of their conferences there the way they've drawn the e there's an e above in the word heaven they've used and it mm-hmm. could be easily well it's not a proper e it could be actually 33 it could as well as being two e's it could easily be 33 now that mm-hmm. to me you know that seems deliberate as well and interestingly you mentioned bethel well that it was actually uh hearing something that bill johnson had said about russell evans and the planet shakers renting out the masonic lodge um, it, it was straight from Bill Johnson's own mouth. That's how I largely found out about what I just mentioned before about Planet Shakers and Russell Evans having started that that church in um, you know renting a Masonic lodge. So yeah, I, I mean, man, there's some slippery slopes, eh? Some some shaky ground when you start going down these avenues that a lot of these mega churches and the the, the sort of emergent church and the New Apostolic Reformation and all these kind of well, branching off into almost cultism, some of them are getting into. Well, can I give you an example of how, it, again, we're, we're not even getting to the topic that we <laughs> want to talk about, but that's okay, because I, I think this is important. I had a friend, he's very excellent on discernment and blogs and writes and speaks really all over the world about it. But he said, you know, you need to go up to Cleveland and check this out. Uh, go to Lakeview Cemetery. It's in uh, sort of on the border of Cleveland and Cleveland Heights. Not too, not too, well, it's Lakeview. You can see Lake Erie from parts of it. And he said, look at, this was a, a largely Baptist Christian cemetery. So he says, just look around and, you'll, and tell me what you see. So I did two things. I won, uh, that's where John, Rockefeller, the scion of the Rockefeller family, is buried. Yeah. And I went to his grave, and his grave has the tallest obelisk in the cemetery over it. So here he is, maybe maybe the richest man who ever lived, uh, by some estimates. Um, you know, started there in Cleveland, uh, Standard Oil, and he has an obelisk over his grave. And there's hundreds and hundreds of obelisks around that cemetery over these graves. And um, Rockefeller was a Baptist. You know, he was considered by some to be a good Baptist, good Christian. But the occult symbolism that is associated with him is amazing. But then just up the hill, even more troubling, is the, the largest mausoleum of any former president of the United States is located in that cemetery. Uh, now, I, I know I grew up about 50 miles away down in Canton, Ohio, and in Canton, uh, there was another, I can't remember if it was Episcopalian or uh, Presbyterian president, a man who became president from Canton, Ohio, named William McKinley. Uh, He was assassinated in 1901 and was succeeded by Teddy Roosevelt. But he was a Mason, and uh, his monument there, there's a large uh, mausoleum where he and his wife and and family are buried there in a park, you know, with the steps up. And it's it's clearly the pagan influences on that are amazing. And, you know, and you can go downtown, you know, a couple miles away to the church he attended and see – the McKinley family pew right there in the church. But in back to Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland, uh, this mausoleum is the largest mausoleum by the president who served, I think, the second shortest amount of days in office, uh, James Garfield. He was in a denomination that I think has eventually morphed into what's known as the Disciples of Christ. Uh, but he was a minister and a lawyer. And he's buried there, and it's this giant circular um, building with a cone uh, at the top. Yeah, you know, goes up to a peak. I've seen it. I think I've got pictures of these things. I'll drop them in in the video underneath this. So if people want to see, yeah, yeah. yeah, And actually, if you go down into the area, there's a a room that you can. It's sort of um, open concrete area 
Uh, and then in there is the the coffins of Garfield and his wife. Uh, his is draped with a flag of the United States. But a rat, there's a like a glass case, and in the corner of the glass case, you got to kind of bend your head around and look at it. Is the actual architectural renderings of the mausoleum, and what essentially this is is the core of a pyramid. Yeah. Yeah. And it's clear the Masonic influence is there. And then in the floor are in the tiles of the floor. And, the, and Garfield died in uh, was assassinated, I think in. 1881. Um, he only served about nine months in office. He was assassinated a couple. He sort of lingered for about seven months after the uh, he was shot. And there are swastikas actually yeah. in the tile floor yeah. of this of yeah. this thing. So I don't know if you knew that or not. Yes, I did. I've uh, got pictures of it, and I'll say I'll put them in if people want to see it. So yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of an interesting. It's one of these things that you know is is largely ignored uh, part of American history. And yet it's a huge part of American history. Um, and I haven't got it in front of me, but again, I'll find it and I'll put it in the video. The quote uh, from uh, Freemason Manly P. Hall talking about that the fa- the founding fathers must have been mystery school adherents to basically have designed the Great Seal of the United States. And that's coming from a, a historian of Freemasonry who was a 33rd degree Freemason. So it's not by chance that all of these things happen. And I know a lot of people sort of talk about the Constitution and, you know, and, and almost enshrine it in some ways and about the Founding Fathers and stuff. But there was definitely a mixture of influence um, in the founding of America right from the word go and Francis Bacon's New Atlantis v- uh, vision and all of that sort of thing. So it's, yeah, very much a mixed history. But we were going to talk about the Middle East and we were also going to talk about some America uh, stuff to do with America, but I think it's probably pertinent to go to the American stuff first now since we've been on on that. What do you actually see happening in, in the United States at the moment? Because I just see this enormous division and even amongst Christians, uh, you know, without getting into the pro or anti-Trump debate or whatever, which I don't want to go there, but I've just seen a nastiness emerging from both sides, the people that support Donald Trump uh, come out, you know, swinging if anyone attacks him, and the people on the left that hate Donald Trump are absolutely beside themselves with unbelievable, you know, hatred. And But I'm seeing even amongst Christians, you can't discuss this subject without it getting to becoming hugely controversial, and it's like something's awfully wrong. Uh, I think, uh, in in what's going on. And I think, man, imagine what it would be like if you have a civil war. If Christians are at each other's throats, even over the whole thing at the moment, what would it be like in that situation? Well, listen, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a Jewish radio talk show guy that I listen to. He's He's not, he's a practicing Jew. His name's Dennis Prager. Uh, he's a very good thinker. Um, he's conservative. Uh, he's just actually released the first book that he wrote on the uh, Torah. His channel, by the way, uh, that he set up on YouTube is called Prager University. His theme is give us five minutes and we'll give you a semester. And so they put up these five minute videos and it's the I think it's the most viewed non-commercial YouTube channel in the world. I mean, it's somewhere around. Uh, between 500 million and a billion hits views last year mm. alone. They put a video up, and by the next day, they're usually at one and a half to two million views. <laughs> we should all have those numbers. <laughs> uh, and they've been put on the restricted list many times by uh, Google that owns YouTube because it, they say it's adult content, and it'll be a video about slavery, uh, you know, how America sort of got rid of slavery and that type of thing. So, so Prager says, and I think I agree with him that we really are already in the civil war in America. It's just a non, non physical violence, civil war. We haven't started the actual 
fighting in the streets and that sort of thing. And this is what I personally see. It, 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 this is American discourse and politics and cultural values has changed dramatically. Personally, I would relate it back to the Supreme Court decision in 1973, Roe, Roe versus Wade, that allowed abortion. It essentially took that decision away from the people. And over time, what the court has done, that's why Anthony Kennedy resigning from the Supreme Court of the United States, has expanded its role and influence in American politics and culture. It has taken things that we used to fight about in legislatures and local uh, legislative bodies, city councils, and that type of thing, and has sort of like, well, we're the Supreme Court, and we're going to make the supreme law of the land. And they've done it on a number of things. Now, look, sometimes it's it's a good decision on race relations or something like that to end discrim- you know, horrible discrimination that took place here in our country. And, and so we all agree with that. But then it takes all these cultural values that are really antithetical to how Christians believe society should be organized, and it, it just takes them off the table. And so that, as a result of that, Supreme Court appointments now are on the order of I, I I don't know I don't know the other any other way to describe it than it's on the order of electing a pope, because they all have lifetime appointments, uh, they serve until they resign. They uh, it's you can't pin them down, and I would say even when somebody tries to appoint a good conservative to the Supreme Court or even you know the other side of the aisle a liberal. It's about a 50-50 shot because you don't know what a guy is going to be like in 30 years. So uh, judges in America are appointed in the federal system, are appointed for life, district court, court of appeals, and Supreme Court. And it's I think there have only been three judges that were impeached that were uh, were moved for misconduct in office in the entire history of the United States. The last one that was removed, the guy was totally corrupt. He was impeached. He was removed as a federal judge and then ran for and was elected to Congress um, <laughs> in the next election. So and I think he's still serving uh, Alcee Hastings. I think I think he's from Florida. So it's hard. And, and so these guys I, I use a local example, a judge that I was in front of uh, many times. Um, he was appointed when he was. um was put in 1966 by Lyndon Johnson, uh, a Democrat. He served on the bench, but he he was in his he was either 59 or just turned 60 when he was appointed to the bench. He served on the bench until 2003. So Lyndon Johnson had been dead for 30 years, and this guy was still on the bench making decisions. Well, the same thing is happening in the Supreme Court. People live longer now. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is, what, is she 85? Uh, This judge that I knew, he served until he was um, 94. Um, And so these people have a long, long influence. So Anthony Kennedy, he took it under his wing that he was going to make decisions on social issues such as sodomy statutes, same-sex marriage, and that sort of thing. And he tipped the court to where those things have become the law of the land. It was just three years ago, three years ago, the end of June, that the United States Supreme Court put in place the Obergefell decision that allowed same-sex marriage in the United States. And this is kind of where I want to go with this. So just what's the name of the replacement for Kennedy? Uh, Kavanaugh? Yeah. See, he's a Jesuit. And that I find concerning, um, considering the fact that there are so many of them uh, in power in the United States. If he is is affirmed, there will be... Um, In terms of religion, there will be five Catholics, one Presbyterian who I believe was went to Jesuit uh, schools growing up, but is now Presbyterian and three Jewish justices on the Supreme Court. And they all went to Harvard or Yale. So it's it's maybe the least diverse 
uh, yeah. court in the world and, uh, you know, the least diverse institution in America. And that's sort of like, I mean, they, they can't find a, an evangelical Christian. Um, it, it's, it's a very strange situation. Well, but, when you, uh, you know, when you look at how the, the Jesuits have taken over the Vatican with Pope Francis and so on, and once upon a time they were actually outlawed by the Catholic Church, and yet now they control the Catholic Church, and then you've got them moving in more and more, it seems, into positions like that in, a, in the United States, um, you've got to wonder again, is this part of an agenda? Well, it, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to make the case that that it is part of an agenda. Uh, it may just be a deterioration of uh, true biblical values. I think, of course, there's no doubt that that's going on. You mentioned earlier that uh, you know the United States grew up. It was this mixture. You know, there were some people that were they were Christian. They were some were not so strong Christians, but some were kind of a mix of Christianity and. Freemasonry, uh, and they all had influence. And and this is this is what one of the things that the Lord warns us about in Revelation chapter three is the church at Laodicea, which if you I sort of hold to the view that the seven churches of Revelation also represent seven pretty much continuous developing eras of church yeah. history. Yeah. And so if this is the time before the Lord returns, it would be the Laodicean yeah. church. And the Laodicean church's big problem is it was a mixture. Well, two problems. It was it was a mixture of some good and bad, but its biggest problem was it didn't realize it was yeah. it was Laodicea. Uh, and it really and if you if you analyze actually the word Laodicea, it really the meaning of it is it, it's essentially the churches the church of everyone's opinion. And boy, is that not a picture of the way things are going right now? Yeah. And social media, as much as I like social media, I like being communicating with my friends on Facebook and Twitter and other, elsewhere. It's an incredibly divisive thing. I mean, uh, you know, the ultimate insult today is to unfriend someone and block them on yeah. Facebook. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, I mean, I even see it among church people that uh, there will be discussions about, uh, I'll use the one that always seems to come up every, every day almost, is the timing of the rapture. And, you yeah. know, there are different views. And, um, and boy, you know, if you don't hold my particular view, the insults start flying. And it's done by all the different views of people who hold other views. Yeah. Uh, and, but that's sort of a, mi a small microcosm of what's going on in our culture. I, I can just tell you, Tony, uh, you know, I'm near, nearing the end of my legal career because of my age. And I, in many respects, I'm glad because I don't know as a evangelical Christian who is conservative politically that I would be able to survive uh, very long uh, going into the future. There's, 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 it, it's almost like the left and other people have this sort of the new Pharisees. They look for everything that manifests itself in all kinds of different things in our society and culture. So three years ago, we had the Supreme Court in the Obergefell decision say same sex marriage is the law of the land. Uh, I remember Obama coming out and speaking like, now let's, you know, some of your friends, they might be conservative and Christian, and we just got to get them to change. We got to yeah. get them to change yeah. their morality. And then, of course, Hillary Clinton, there was the famous quote of hers that long held moral beliefs need to be changed. Yeah. I mean, I played that over and over in my uh, weekly updates to remind people this, this is really what she wants. Well, now here we are three years down the road. And we have the rise of this transgender agenda and people, people are losing their jobs. The University of Minnesota has just come out with new guidelines that you have to refer to people by their chosen pronoun, Z, they, whatever it is, uh, 
saw the other day people saying we shouldn't call them a boy baby or girl baby. They should be called babies. Because <laughs> it's, it's, insane. It, it's just it's it's insanity. Yeah. And as I've heard Dennis Prager point out on his show a number of times, the culture has gone completely stark raving mad yeah. because the the homosexual community will say sexual orientation is fixed. You can't change it. And so there's a law in California now that's going through the legislature. I hear it comes up for a vote in early August. I think it's uh, Bill uh, AB uh, 2943 to essentially outlaw anybody fired. Like if you get a donation or uh, money uh, to counsel someone to ch- they they say they come to you and say I'm homosexual I don't want to be I want to be heterosexual if you counsel them you're subject you're committing cons- under the California statute essentially consumer fraud and there's a lot of concern I think it's a valid concern that that will eventually lead to things like the Bible could be banned or certain Christian books could be banned because they say that people can be, you know, just quoting from the books of Corinthians, you can be transformed. Such were some of you, but now you are transformed. You're not that anymore. And the University of Minnesota, if you don't use the, under the new guidelines, if you don't use the proper um, pronouns when referring to someone, If you go to the university, you will be subject to being expelled from a public university in the United States. Or if you work for the university, your employment can be terminated. So it's it's really reached, I think, um, a tipping point. So they say that your sexual orientation is fixed, but your gender, being born male or female, that can be changed. It's insane, isn't it? It, it, it's and, and you and when you try to have a conversation with people like that about how insane that is, they they sort of look at you like, well, that I don't know, I don't understand what you're talking about. Why why would that concern you? Um, and and we have and there's this push. I mean, there are transgender people coming into classrooms of four or five year old kids in kindergarten. And it's just, it's part of it's to break down any sense of biblical uh, morality. And I mean, that's that's the ultimate agenda is to get rid of any. And, and so look, three years. And, and listen, when, when Obergefell came out, I stood up and I said, I don't know where this is going to end. But this is not the end. This is a much bigger agenda. And I don't want to call myself a prophet, but three years later, it sure looks like I was right. And it's it's getting, it's everywhere you turn. A couple of weeks ago, um, well, it was about a month ago. Well, I guess it was a few weeks ago. Uh, Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States, came and some of the people in our law firm are politically connected. So they got us like front row seats. So I, I said, okay, I'm going to go over in here Vice President Pence. Uh, So I was sitting there in the front row, but I had to walk down a street in Columbus. It's called Gay Street, ironically. And it was Stonewall Columbus Pride Festival weekend. And they were having the drag queen dance party on Gay Street that I had to walk through on my way over to here, (laughs) the Vice President of the United States. And there were a number of people that stood up and started yelling and screaming and shouting and were drug out of the the room where the president was speaking. So the vice president was speaking. So um, it's, I'm concerned about the direction that it's going. Um, I I really don't know. Um, I don't, I don't know that. And I don't know what goes on in New Zealand. I I don't know that there's any place that this is not a big agenda. I, I mean, it happens in Italy where the Vatican is located it happens. I mean, pretty much everywhere follows uh, follows America's lead, though globally. Really, well, I think I that's mean, what but, happens. But yesterday, I, I'll give you an example. Yesterday was Tish B'Av on the Jewish calendar, which is the day that they get together and they they mourn, they remember the destruction. I mean, there are a lot of things in Jewish history that happened on Tish B'Av. There was 
the report of the spies when they were uh, had left Egypt in the wilderness, that happened on Tishbaya. Uh, there was the first temple was destroyed. The second temple was destroyed. Uh, the Bar Kokhba rebellion was squelched on Tishbayov. Uh, in, t- I think it was 1290, the Jews were expelled from Britain, from England, on Tishbayov. In 1492, on Tishbayov, they were expelled from Spain. So it's a, it's a day of mourning in Jewish history. But the other event, so there were all these uh, Jews, religious Jews, at the Western Wall, And they were singing, they were actually singing a song about looking for the Messiah, interestingly enough. Uh, It's very beautiful, very moving. And uh, and we can argue about whether that's good or bad. What are they looking for? Some of those people will come to faith in the true Messiah. We know that. Some will follow a false one, though. That's we have to acknowledge that. But the other thing going on in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem was a gay pride strike because there was a law or regulation put in place in Israel that said that uh, same-sex couples can't use a surrogate to have a baby. I think that's what the legislation or regulation was. And so they were protesting that. They went on a national strike. Sunday is the first day of the week, work week in, in Israel. And they were blocking streets and protesting in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and elsewhere in Israel. And so you have this this incredible divide that it's just happening everywhere. It's it's an incredible thing to watch. Mm. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, It's funny because I remember back in the early 90s, maybe it would have been late 80s, early 90s, Hearing somebody, I'm trying to remember who it was. It might have been Cy Rogers or someone like that in a, a um, in a kind of a seminar talking about how what we're seeing today with this LGBT agenda was going to come to pass. He he was saying back then that th- this is the agenda, but it just seemed so far fetched at the time. I thought it's never going to happen. Now <laughs> you know, and now I'm looking at. What we're, what he said was the agenda has absolutely come to f- fruition. It, it started off in New Zealand with a civil union bill back in the, um, oh, I can't remember what year it was, you know, where the gays were allowed a civil union bill, not marriage, and it was sort of that was going to be the end of it. But, of course, it wasn't because that was always step one for where we are at now. You know, but at that time, it just seemed so far-fetched because pe- people didn't embrace it. The average New Zealander really didn't like it, but it kind of well, it, it's, it's, it's sort of reaching. Yeah, it's reaching an insanity point, though. There's, uh, I was reading an article just this morning about, uh, you know, the LGBTQ and then plus and a bunch of other yeah. letters that they've they keep they seem to keep adding these others, intersectional and all those others. Uh, but there's some lesbian groups now that want to remove the L from LGBTQ because the T's, the transgender men who are want to become a woman but are still attracted to women are true lesbians because they're not female and then they couldn't be a true f- feminist. If it, it's just. It's it's sort of it's almost impossible to sit down and have a rational discussion to describe what's going on. But what's what's clear as to what's going on is that society, culture, government, and I'm 64, so I've been around a little while, it's more divided than I ever remember it being. It's really yeah. reached a I think we're at a very serious tipping point, uh, particularly in America. I don't know the direction that it's going, but it's 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 hard to talk about. I, somebody was criticizing me because I used the word I was def- describing uh, uh, the former director of the CIA, James Clapper. I think he was CIA or National Intelligence. He was describing Trump, and he just said, "You know, this is." Uh, He's, uh, this is like Auschwitz, you know, this, uh, uh, I've been to Auschwitz and what they're doing with separating families at the border is this is like Auschwitz where they separated families. And it's like, 
and I don't know that that's historically accurate because I don't know that they separated children from their mothers in, in, in Auschwitz and the death camps. But I, I said he's a moral he's a moral idiot or a moral fool. And somebody was very upset with me. And I it's it's hard for me not to use those terms because I don't know how else to describe it. And I think it does have a biblical basis in Romans chapter one. It says that, you know, they will get consumed by these lusts. They will give themselves over and God will send a judgment on them and they will become they'll become fools. They're, they'll become as morons. They won't be able to reason. And I see this more and more. It's hard to have a good rational discussion with someone about these topics because we've become so consumed with feelings. And what's more concerning to me is, and I, I started speaking out about this maybe 20 years ago in some you know, conference things that I spoke about the influence of postmodernism and feelings that were coming onto the church. And 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 looks what what's happened. Look, we used to talk about the emerging church a lot in discernment type ministries and Bible prophecy oriented ministries. You don't talk about the emerging church much anymore. It's just not discussed in those terms. Now, maybe people got tired of it. I think the more troubling aspect of it is that the emerging church actually won. They, they, they became more influential in the churches than we could even hope to imagine. And this is this is prophetic. This is this is part of uh, what Jesus described, or not what Paul described as the great falling away that would occur before the day of the Lord. Now I don't I think it's got a I think it still has a little bit of a ways to go, but um, I've looked I've I've likened it to this. Um, get a big trash can and start filling it with apostasy. Let's say filling it with water and the water is the apostasy. At some point it overflows and it causes a flood. And we're getting pretty close to that can being full, I'm afraid. Yep. Uh, but it's it's what the Lord said to expect. And and I I talk about it a lot in what I do and the things I do at church each week. Because if not for any other reason than to sort of give comfort to other believers that, you know, this stuff really is happening. You're not losing your mind. They are. You're not. But this is just the way that it's it's supposed to go, unfortunately. Yeah, it's certainly troubling and uh, um, and bewildering <laughs> in a way what's, what's happening. And it, it uh, just seems completely insane, really. Um, so much of what I'm seeing and uh, it seems like so many people are caught up in in it all um, it, it's hard to well it's hard to really see how it can ever be brought back into any sort of line other than that it's it's going to continue to get worse I mean look I, I'll give you an example here's one more example I got somebody sent me an email the other day about the Willow Creek Global Leadership Leadership Summit, and it had a video, a promo video attached to it. Now, this came out of the Willow Creek Church, which became started the Willow Creek Association. And if you go to the website now, it says um, Global Leadership Summit. Uh, it might be Leadership Summit or something like that. Is the website dot org? It, it says you know powered by Willow Creek Association. So the, it's, the Willow Creek Association is now sort of morphed into this leadership-oriented thing. And this is something I noticed um, in the church uh, that I, in sort of national fellowship of churches that I was involved in, was everything became about leadership. Everybody was concerned about leadership, leadership, leadership. And it just, it was changing the biblical orientation of, of servant leadership and there, you know, there's leadership network and Peter Drucker and the influence there with Rick Warren and all of those organizations. And so here they have the Global Leadership Summit. They're projecting that they will have, I think it's in early August, 445,000 
leaders, church leaders mainly from around the world, attend. They'll simulcast it. Um, they're charging. Now, I understand that some of the foreign, a lot of those several hundred thousand maybe foreign people that are being underwritten by the fees paid by the American attenders, but it's $209 each. You can get a group rate, get it down to about $170, I think, if you have 15 people from your organization attend. But it's it's a lot of secular business leaders and that type of things. It's not really even what I would call a church thing, but it grows out of the Willow Creek Association, which is Willow Creek Church. And I, I personally don't see any distinction between those organizations it's the different wings of the same bird if you will. Uh, it's, it's like a lot of to me it's almost corporations masquerading and calling themselves churches but really what they are is just like corporations um and well i've seen the influence i i ran into somebody that knew someone i, I was i took the afternoon off i was uh, in a different city and i don't really want to say it and I'm going to stop. I, there's a golf course here, and I want to play this. I've never played this golf course. So I started talking to the guy. It was a, it was a holiday, and it was, no, it was just a Monday. And he had his 12-year-old son with him. And I'm like, Wait, why aren't you in school? He goes, well, it's, you know, fair day. It was They lived in an agricultural community. And I knew immediately then that the guy, I could tell that he attended a church, and I knew which church it was. And so I asked him, and this church had become part of the Willow Creek Association. And I had knew a little bit about the church. I, you know, knew a lot of people there. And I was concerned about that association. And I asked him, I said, so what are your sermons about? And uh, he said, oh, you know, there are five ways to be a better husband and five ways to be better person in your business and that sort of thing. And I said, does, are there ever any sermons about Bible prophecy subjects or anything like that? And he goes, no, not really. Uh, we don't usually get into that stuff. Now, this is, it unfortunately confirmed what I was afraid of. So I actually went to the church website and found that they were in the middle of a sermon series. And it was called uh, I, I hesitate to, I, you know, because I, I love a lot of the people there. and But the sermon series was Real Life Lessons from Superheroes. Oh, week man. one, Superman. Week two, oh, Spider-Man. Week three, Batman. Yeah. I, I'm not kidding that you. Is, I, I, oh, man. Yeah. That does sum this is, it up. This is a, what you would consider to be a fairly conservative evangelical church. Now, this was probably about five years ago that this happened, um, but it it was it was disturbing to me, but and probably more disturbing because it was not surprising because I could see that one coming. And so I, you know, I I don't want to sound like a Pharisee or anything like that, but um, I've been around for a while. And I've paid attention. Um, my father was a pastor, and I can take you and show you talks and sermons and notes that he had. Were back in the '60s when I was, you know, in my uh, middle school and high school years, he was talking about these things. So it's always it's always been something that's been on my radar. And I I often wonder, like, if dad if my dad was still alive, what. I think his head would explode. I, I just don't know how else to say it. He he would not believe what what I'm seeing. Yeah, that's that's probably true. Well, we haven't even gotten to talk about the the Middle East. We might have to come back and talk about that in another day, John, because okay. <laughs> our time has pretty yeah, guess, much come running out, is it? Very quickly. Yeah. Well, I, I think maybe the Lord led this direct yeah. this thing to go in a different direction. The the world's in turmoil. Yeah. Let me just say, maybe maybe if you want me to try to wrap it up, is this. We need to remember that what we see going on in society, in culture, in values, in church, in politics, is a physical manifestation 
of a bigger spiritual battle that's going on and raging in the heavenlies. You know, we, we know the story in Daniel chapter 10, where Daniel fasted and prayed, and he prayed for 21 days, and he finally received the answer from the Lord through an angel. And the angel said, I was dispatched, Daniel, the day you started praying. But I was met with resistance by the prince of Persia. And until I got help, I wasn't able to get through. And so, and Paul tells us in the New Testament that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so we, we need to understand that whatever we're seeing going on in our immediate life and world and life is really a reflection of what I think is a great war that's raging in the heavenlies. And that war is ramping up and it's going to manifest itself through many things here on the earth. So we need to be while it's distressing to live through, we also need to be encouraged that we know the ultimate outcome, that Jesus wins and Jesus reigns, and that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm hoping for. And frankly, if it's if I'm like a lot of other people, I'm ready for it to come to that conclusion now. Yeah. Enough is enough. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so yeah, thanks, John. We, we you know we've certainly gone in a different direction with this show than what we intended, but I yeah, I'm sure it was God's direction, not what we had intended. That's come through. So that has been great to have you on the Minute to Midnight show again today. Can you just close off by telling our listeners where they can find you online? Sure. Um, uh, you you can get. I still have some space left in the number of friends that I have on Facebook. But always send me an email or a message and tell me uh, where you heard me or that type of thing because I get a lot of of trolls in in some very questionable uh, females and that type of thing asking me for friendship. Um, so do that. You can also our church website is fbchapel.com Fellowship Bible Chapel, fbchapel.com. And then we have a YouTube channel called Fellowship um, by Fellowship Bible Chapel or my name. Uh, that should get you to our YouTube channel. We put up all of our sermons, little conferences that we have, my prophecy update, uh, all put up there uh, for free each week. And I know that there are other places that there's some podcasts that strip out the audio from my prophecy update, Rapture Ready, Rapture Ready Radio uh, puts my stuff up each week, too. So uh, just look for my name, Google my name, and it should be out there. Awesome. Well, thank you for being on um, the show again today, John. And we'll have to come back in a, in a short space of time, perhaps, and do the Middle East stuff another well, day. I'm, I'm pretty confident, Tony, that... If we delay uh, talking about the Middle East for a few weeks even, uh, it's still going to be in a great state of turmoil. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, pretty, so. I'm not a prophet, but I'm pretty sure that's a fairly <laughs> safe prediction. So yeah. Syria is still going to be there. Yeah. Well, thank you, John. Thanks, Tony. God bless. God bless you too. Folks, it would be great if you could click the like button for this video and also share it and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already done so and visit our website a minute to midnight.com where you'll find all our shows and we also have them on iTunes as well for those that like to just listen to the podcast rather than watching the video you can catch us there. All the music written, played and recorded for the show is done by me and you can find some free music which you can download at a minute to midnight.com as well and we do have articles on there as well as the shows also we run a minute to midnight entirely by donations uh, we really appreciate the people that do donate and after it had been such a lean time with donations for a while to, to the point of being scary i have to say people really stepped up in the last week or so and it's been just such a blessing to receive the money that's been coming in, helping us out. Myself, Brooke and Joni, we really appreciate it uh, greatly. So you can donate if you want to help us out on our website, a minute to midnight.com, and you'll find links there 
to donate either through PayPal or DonorBox or you can get in touch with us if you want to donate another way. I think that's about it for this show. Thanks for listening and we will be back with another show in a few days time. So until then, God bless and have a great week. This is Tony signing off until the next show. Thank you.